Good morning and welcome to managerial accounting. As we do every day, we'll start with a look at our calendar to talk about what's due, what's coming up. Everybody has a good sense of, of where you stand. We discussed this a couple times already before the end of the day today. Step two for the project, which is just three sources, one, the company, two external sources, no particular format, um, a link to, this, to the source, a sentence or two about how you're going to use that source to, to complete your project. So that should be submitted by the end of the day today. We finished up chapter 20 last class and the chapter 20 problem should be submitted for grading by the end of the day today. But as there have been many, many questions about that problem, as I said before we started class, we're going to look at that problem today and work through a little bit more of it together as a class. Um, it, we also went through part of it and did an overview in the review session last Friday. So if you need more than what you've got today, um, start with that video. And if you still have questions, as always, you don't need to submit by the end of the day today. If you still are working on it and need help, you can let me know. I would be happy to help with that. And then we will be starting chapter 21 today after we finish what I want to talk about from the chapter 20 problem. So the chapter 21 pre-quiz should be submitted for grading by the end of the day as well. Tomorrow, as you've heard me say, and I know I put it in the announcements last week, tomorrow the midterm grades are due, six week grades. And so I will be waiting until tomorrow to put yours in. As I've explained, anything that is past due but has not been submitted for grading, so even if you've worked on it, you have to submit it for grading, and then I will bring those grades over into the Blackboard Gradebook. Anything that's past due and does not has not been submitted for grading will be averaged in as a zero. I will accept from that the Chapter 20 problem. So if you're still working on the chapter 20 problem after today, don't worry about it. That's not going to average into your grade as a zero. Um, but everything else that is past due, everything else that was due today or earlier will be included in your six week grade, which is due tomorrow. And your grade in Blackboard will be the grade in Banner. So you, um, you still of course want to go into Banner after tomorrow say after five o'clock tomorrow um, and look at your grades because it's not necessarily true for all of your classes that the grade book in Blackboard reflects your current standing in the course. Okay, any questions about that? All right. Also just a, you'll see a um, note here on the calendar next Tuesday at the very beginning of class for about five minutes, we will be having a presentation from mm -hmm. Bellevue University. Many of you may have already heard that. If you were in this class last semester in financial accounting, you heard it there. Um, she did update the presentation a little bit, so I'm not sure exactly what changed, maybe dollar amounts or, or something like that. But um, please be respectful, join class on time that day, if at all possible. She will be physically present here on the Cattaraugus County campus in the classroom and, and she'll present on Zoom too, of course. After that, I will um, I'll record her separately and I'll post that new recording where the recording from last semester is in the reference materials. So plan for that. Please try to be on time. I, I'm normally very flexible about people coming in and out as needed but we want to be respectful of our guest presenter as well. Um, Friday, this Friday, the 11th, I didn't put it in the calendar, but I can. We are going to have another group review session. I think the name that the um, Starfish folks landed on was drop in review or drop in tutoring maybe um, it needed to be different than 
than what they use for, they needed it to be different than what they used for the tutors, the student peer tutors. And so I think what it's called is drop in review. And in Starfish, I can't show it to you, but it should now appear in Starfish in the same way that a peer tutor would show up. So if you just go to this course, rather than having to go to me and go through all of the steps that we had to do last week of signing up, saying discuss coursework and, and that kind of thing, um, it should show up to you right there. That there's a review session scheduled for this Friday morning at nine o'clock. At this point, I don't know what we're talking about. Those sessions are totally up to you. I was thinking that as we get closer to the exam, so you can see looking ahead that next weekend, starting on St. Patrick's Day, next weekend, exam two will be ready for you. And that covers three chapters. So that's 19, 20, and 21. And it's, I was thinking about it, that maybe it would make sense in those drop-in review sessions to talk about some of the practice exercises if there aren't any, any other questions that people uh, find more pressing. So if you plan to come on Friday, please make sure you sign up through Starfish to come to that session. And if there's something specific that you want to, to talk about or go over, just let me know and we will, I'll be happy to do that with you. At this point, um, because we have the exam coming up in chapters 19, 20, and 21, I'd really be happy to talk about anything from those chapters to help people prepare for that exam. All right, so please make sure you sign up. And if there aren't any questions, we're going to go to the chapter 20 problem. No questions? Okay. So in the video from last Friday's review session, we did go through this top part on cost behavior and separating, um, using the high-low method to separate fixed and variable. So I'm assuming everybody's okay with that part in that we can start here at the contribution margin section. If you do have questions in that first part, I would refer you first to the review session video from last Friday. And then again, if you're stuck and need help, feel free to ask. But I'm gonna start here at the contribution margin section where we get to cover to cover compared to bibliophiles company. I need to point out that your, the values you have in your problem maybe are different than what's on the screen. So as I go through the, the steps of doing this, you're not going to want to just use my answers. You're going to want to take the approach or the method that I go through and use the numbers, the values that are in your problem, because I do believe that they are different. Maybe they're not, but I think they are. Can anyone confirm that? Just looking at what I have on the screen here, are these the same numbers you're seeing? Looks like They're the same? Okay. Sharon, are yours the same? I'm just looking through at you real quick here. So Sharon is actually in a different section of the class. So it could be that hers are different. Keisha's in that same section. So Keisha, if Sharon's are different, yours are too probably. Mine's so a different. Okay. So Keisha, yours are probably different as well, but people who are registered for the Zoom face-to-face -face section may have these same numbers. So 
either way, as I said, I really don't want you to just take what I do and plug it into yours. I want you to try this on your own. So we're going to talk, walk through, talk through how to find um, the values, the answers you need for your problem. So starting with contribution margin ratio, the formula for that is contribution margin. So there's for cover to cover, contribution margin is 83,800 divided by the sales. And so that's right there, 419. So using my numbers, then the contribution margin ratio for cover to cover is 0.2 or 20%. The next question is about unit contribution margin. We know the total contribution margin again, whoops, sorry, $83,800 right there at the bottom of the screen. And that's for 83,800 units. So they make the math nice and simple for us. $83,800 divided by 83,800 units gives us a contribution margin of $1 per unit. To find our break-even sales dollars, we're going to use that same formula that we derived last week and we have been using consistently, which is units is fixed cost plus profit divided by contribution margin per unit. Break even is that special case where profit is zero. So to find the break even sales in units, we simply need to take our fixed costs, which they have helpfully included for us here, 20,950, and divide by the contribution margin per unit, $1. And so they would need to sell 20,950 units to break even. From there, they want us to find the sales dollars. Well, I don't know what the selling price per unit is, but I can find that by taking our total sales right here and dividing by the number of units. And so the selling price per unit is $5. If we're going to sell 20,950 units at $5 each, our break-even sales would be $104,750. There's another way to do that though. And the other way to do it is by taking the, where is that? Um, yeah, by taking our, oops, sorry. By taking the break-even sales units that we already calculated and dividing by the contribution margin ratio. So from a formula standpoint, that makes sense. To me, that's not the easiest way to remember. So, um, but you are welcome to do it either way. Again, the formula that I just mentioned to go from break-even sales units to dollars is to take the units and divide by the contribution margin ratio. That will work. Um, to me, it's just not as intuitive as doing it by multiplying units by dollars per unit. So I assume with that explanation for how to do cover to cover that you would then be able to do bibliophiles on your own does anyone have any questions about that part? Okay. I do. Can you tell me really quickly how you got the unit contribution margin? I know you took that yep. 83,800, but what did you divide it by? Yep, so I took the total contribution margin, what you just said, $83,800 from the income statement. And it tells us right here how many units they sold. So if I take the total dollars and divide by the total units, that will give me the, um, the contribution margin per unit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. So the question in the classroom was, can I explain where this number, the break even sales dollars came from again? So the, the way to me that it makes the most intuitive sense to do it is to multiply the units that we're going to sell by the price we're going to charge our customers. 
but I didn't know what that price was. And so I had to go down here to their income statement and find the selling price. And the way I did that was I took the sales and divided by the number of units they sold. And I found that they were selling them for $5 each. So if they're going to sell 20,950 units at $5 each, 20,950 times five is the break even dollars. The other way I said you can do it, which would have been less math, but it remember it, it takes a little bit different type of thinking is take the break even sales units and divide by the contribution margin. So you'll get the same answer. It's just, to me, it's not as linear thinking, you know, this is what we do in accounting and this is how, this is what sales are based on. How many units did we sell? How much did we charge for them? So we're a little bit less familiar with the contribution margin ratio. So I think that doesn't feel quite as correct. Either way works though. Okay, any other questions about this section? Keisha, does that answer your question from earlier? Yeah, because I was doing the um, the dividing that you said, mm -hmm. the break even sales divided by the percent, okay. but I didn't get the right answer every time. So I just did what you did and I got the answer. Okay, yeah, I, I thought it was interesting. I'm not calling you out or anything, but I thought it was interesting because you had it for cover to cover. And then for some reason, yeah, something was coming apart with the bibliophile. So I'm glad that that helped. Cindy, quick question. Yep. If we do that same um, calculation for the bibliophiles, mm -hmm. it comes, it, it's giving me a result of one, two, six, two, five, zero. And I have to mu multiply that by two to get the break even sales in dollars. Numbers. Give me just a moment. Sure. Your, your numbers are. Oh, it's different. Yep. Yeah. So give me one second here. Oh, and it, yeah, and Keisha, that's the same thing that you were getting too. That's this, I recognize that number from earlier. I'm gonna, I don't, I'm not sure why that's not working. I'm gonna have to think about that. You have to double it. That's what I just figured it out. You have to double it. Yeah, but that I answer. I yeah, why. it's weird. <laughs> I, I'm gonna have to, to give that some thought because there's something I'm missing there but I'm, I'm not gonna be able to come up with it just on the fly standing here in class. So let me think about that and I will let I will get back to you about what, what I'm missing with that calculation. So, and that's probably why I'm saying it's, it's just not intuitive for me to do it that way. So I will get back to you about that. Um, I just have to make myself a note so I remember to do that later. So for the last part of the question, I had to multiply by two to get something too. So I kind of figured maybe it was the unit contribution margin being two. I don't know. <laughs> I will get back to you about that. Um, I'm going to move on for now. But as long as you, as long as you're able to follow my preferred approach, which is taking the units and multiplying by the sales price. But I will get back to you about that other question because I don't know why that's not working. So let's move on to this section, which I think is probably the sticking point for, for many of you. This is the sales mix question. And what makes this different than what we did in class is it already gives you 
the weighted average contribution margin of $2.31. And we have to, from that, calculate what the actual sales mix is. As is frequently the case with these mastery problems, they're trying to make you think about, okay, where would that number come from? And it's not a realistic scenario that we would already know that end result and have to back into the beginning, um, beginning calculations. That being said, we can do it. And it's just more of an algebra question than it is, a, um, than it is an accounting question. So let's think about what this would look like to take this weighted average contribution margin of $2.31 and determine from that what the contribution margin, no, that's not what I meant to say, what the percentage of the sales mix would be for each of these. So I'm going to start with finding the individual contribution margin for each one of the products that we sell. So for basic, and again, your numbers may be different, a little bit different than what I have here. So keep that in mind that you may need to repeat these calculations with somewhat different numbers. So these are the individual contribution margins. Selling price minus variable cost per unit gives us the contribution margin per unit for the two products that they are selling, basic and deluxe. And we know that the formula for finding the weighted average is we take the contribution margin for each product and then multiply it by its percent of the sales mix. But I don't know what that is. So I'm just going to call it X for basic. So X represents the percent of the sales mix for the basic bookshelves. And then we would add to that the contribution margin for deluxe times its percent of the sales mix, but I don't know what that is. I don't wanna call it Y because then I'd have two variables. What do we know? That the percent for basic and the percent for deluxe must equal 100%. So if I take 100% and subtract the percent that goes to basic, I will have left the percent that goes to deluxe. That's why I said this is much more of an algebra equation than it is accounting. So that's the formula based on the individual contribution margins that I have and the dollar amount it told us right here was the weighted average. So if you work your way through that, and I'm going to actually do that with us because I know that there are people that are just not terribly fond of algebra. So I'm gonna walk through this. Again, if your numbers are different, you'll have to do this on your own. So 90 cents times 100%. I'm just distributing the 90 cents to get rid of these parentheses. We're following order of operations or PEMDAS. So 90 cents times 100% minus 90 cents, oops, 90 cents, not $90, times X. Now I can combine like terms, 325 minus 90 X would be 235. If I subtract 90 cents from each side, I get- So it's gonna be 90 cents, even though it's times by 100%. Because 100% is one, right? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I could, yeah, it'd be hard to, I want to keep the dollar sign label there. Yeah. So the question in the classroom, in case you couldn't hear it, is what do we do with this percent sign, basically? So what I'm suggesting is rather than thinking of that as 100%, just think of it as one. And that's the, I'm just going to throw out the math term because I can't. That's the multiplica multiplication identity. Multiplying anything by one um, is the number itself. So yes, it stays 90 cents because I don't know what to do with the percent sign and the dollar sign. And I, I need to keep that dollar sign as the label. So I'm mm -hmm. just gonna think of that as a one. And then if I wanna get X by itself, Divide both sides by $2.35 and 
and what I get is 0.6 or 60%. And so if the basic shelves are 60%, then the deluxe shelves are 40% because it has to equal 100% of the sales mix. I'm assuming that that's the part that was most challenging for the, for the many people who were asking questions about the sales mix part of this problem. So is there anyone, and I'll, I'll walk through these last two pieces here, but is there anyone who wants to ask a question before I do, before I do that? Does this make sense? Even though it's, it's a little more complicated, um, like I said, it's definitely algebra, not accounting. So I'm gonna assume everybody's okay at this point. So from there, we would use that same formula that we've been using that we derived together a week ago to find our break-even units. It is fixed, fixed cost divided by contribution margin per unit. You're going to use the weighted average contribution margin of $2.31 or whatever your problem says. Divide that into the fixed costs, which are given right here. So if you take those fixed costs, divide by the contribution margin per unit that's given, we will find the total number of units that need to be sold. And we know that 60% of those are going to be basic and 40% will be deluxe. So you can fill in this. And then we're told right here how much those are selling for. $5 for the basic and $9 for the deluxe. So you can then um, multiply the break-even units by those dollars to get um, the break-even sales in dollars. Everybody okay with that? Anyone who wants to ask a question before I clear my annotations on the screen and, and just Turn to that last section. Okay. So the last section is target profit. So what if they want to increase their profit? I've had a couple questions about this one and I think for um, some people who are asking the question, it may be a misreading of the question. So they want to increase their profit. So if we look at their income statements up here, they're already budgeting to make a profit. And what if they want that to go up by $40,000? What would their total sales be? So there's a couple different ways you could do this. You could change this number to 102,850 and then back into what your numbers up above would need to be. But there's a, if you understand the idea of contribution margin, there's a very easy, straightforward way of calculating this. So cover to cover wants to increase its profit by 40%. Up here, we had calculated that cover to cover unit contribution margin is $1. What that means is once they break even, every additional unit they sell contributes, hence the name contribution margin, contributes $1 toward their operating income. So if they want to increase their operating income by $40,000, they need to sell 40,000 more units at $1 each in contribution margin. Sell 40,000 more units. So they already sold 83,800. If they need to sell 40 more, that would be 123,800. And how much are they charging for them? We already calculated this. They were charging $5 per unit. So we can take the new number of units, 83,800 plus the additional 40,000 multiplied by $5 per unit, that will give us our total sales, which is what's asked for here in number one. Now with the numbers I have in my exercise, or excuse me, my problem, Bibliophile's contribution margin, I believe is $2 per unit. I don't have that calculated here on the screen, but I, I believe that's what I 
had seen um, working through this earlier. So if it's $2 per unit, then they want to make 40,000 more, they'd have to sell 20,000 more units. And so for Bibliophile, their sales units would go from 83,800 to 103,800. They're also charging $5 per unit. And so you can find the dollars there. And then the last piece is, um, the last part is, why is that the case? Their numbers look basically the same at this point. Their sales are the same, their operating income is the same. The number of units they're selling is the same. Why, when we add 40, 000, to add 40,000 more in income, why are the numbers, the total units and total sales not the same? So that's the question you're answering here. And it has to do with the fact that their contribution margin is different because the although their total expenses are the same, if you look at cover to cover here and bibliophile, their total expenses are the same, but the split between their fixed cost and variable cost is very different. And that's why the numbers um, work out to be so different um, in the end when they want to increase their profit. Okay, any questions, any more questions, anything else you wanna talk about related to this chapter 20 problem? So once you have your units, you would just multiply those units by the selling price. So $5 for basic and $9 for deluxe. Okay, so what I would like to ask you to do then is to try, if you were, if you were stuck, if you had questions on this, try with what we just went through to um, complete the problem. If you get stuck again, let me know. I'd ha be happy to work with you one-on-one um, -on -one to get you through wherever you're stuck. At this point, we have talked our way through the entire problem between today and Friday's review session, and both of those are recorded and are or will be available um, for you if you want to go back and rewatch any of it um, so that you can pause and then try something on your own. That's fine too. Okay. Any questions then before we move on with today's work? Okay, I hope that helped. And I am going to pull up my chapter 21 exercises and I would suggest you do the same. And we'll get started with the new chapter. Oops. Maybe, there we go. Okay. So our new chapter, this is, as you know, the last chapter for exam two. So as I told you at the beginning of the semester, because we're covering 14 chapters and we have only four exams this semester, the exams cover four, three, four, three chapters. So this is one of the three chapter exams. The exams are all equally weighted. So exam one and exam two carry the same weight toward your final grade. So I guess maybe I, I would say that exams two and four that cover only three chapters um, should be a little bit easier because it's less material on that exam. And so hopefully that will help people's grades if you're not happy with where your grade is right now. And so again, in this chapter, we're going to be talking about variable costing for management analysis. And I had mentioned this idea in uh, maybe even in the last chapter. So in a nutshell, the difference between absorption and variable costing is what we do with some of the product costs, with our fixed costs. How do we handle those fixed costs? Because um, 
variable costing that we have been talking about um, that we use and are required to use for GAAP for financial accounting purposes may lead us to make some in, inappropriate, incorrect, not very efficient decisions about how to run our company. And so in this chapter, we're going to be looking at an alternative for internal decision making, which is what we're talking about this semester, management or managerial decision making. How best to make decisions about our product, about the costs that are associated with making and, and selling our product. Um, and I may have just said that backward. I think I may have just said absorption co or variable costing. I apologize. Um, I must have looked at the wrong word on my screen. So, and then just said what I was looking at. Absorption costing is what's required for GAAP. Variable costing is what we are learning in new in this chapter. And I, I'm not sure I said it backward, but if I did, I, I scratch what I said. Absorption costing is what we have learned in earlier chapters. Absorption costing assigns the direct costs to the units that are produced in the period that those costs are incurred. Variable costing says, yeah, but are we really rewarding um, the wrong type of behavior in our company if we allow those fixed costs to rest on the balance sheet, <clears throat> excuse me, as part of our inventory until we actually sell it. And so the concept of variable costing says, the only costs that go on the balance sheet as inventory are the variable costs that go with those units. And fixed costs are going to be expensed in the month, in the period that they are incurred. What that does is reward but what it does not do is reward producing for inventory because when we produce for inventory rather than produce for a sale, it allows us to maybe hide some of those fixed costs. I'm not, I'm not really suggesting that there is a, an ethical issue. I'm not really suggesting someone's attempting to defraud the public because that would certainly raise the question, well, then why do we use absorption costing for financial reporting if we don't wanna use it for internal decision-making if it somehow skews our picture? <clears throat> Excuse me. But it does help us to see um, the impact of those fixed costs on our, on our results internally if we look at them as, yeah, but they're fixed. We can't control them. And so we shouldn't, be, um, we shouldn't be allowing a decision about how much to produce to switch, to shift some of those fixed costs away from the period in which they're incurred. So that's, that is the, um, in a nutshell, explanation of what variable costing is and what it does. We have been looking at our income statement in this format since chapter five at a minimum. So in chapter five, we introduced the multi-step income statement. We reviewed this last, uh, last chapter, last week, when we introduced the contribution margin income statement. So this is the, uh, the traditional way, the financial accounting required, gap required way of reporting our income. Here's our revenues from sales. Here's the product cost, including not only the variable, but also the fixed costs, direct labor, direct materials, and overhead. From that, we can calculate our gross profit or gross margin. Then we subtract our selling and administrative expenses to find our operating income. In the last chapter, we changed that formula a bit so rather than dividing our costs based on whether they're product or period, we divide them based on whether they are fixed or variable. Then in this chapter, we're going to take that one step further. So in, in this chapter, we're going to be looking at our fixed 
manufacturing costs, the fixed overhead or the fixed product costs separate separately from our fixed selling and general and administrative expenses, those fixed period expenses. So under variable costing, those fixed overhead costs, manufacturing overhead are going to be treated as a period expense rather than as part of the product. So this gives you what I've just said graphically or visually. In chapter 15, when we started this semester back in January, we learned that the cost of goods manufactured for a product includes direct materials, direct labor, and both fixed and variable overhead. Now um, we are separating that fixed factory overhead and instead of treating it as part of the cost of the product, we're going to treat it as a period expense. And the rationale is those costs are fixed. We know in advance what they are. We should not be hiding them or masking them by allowing some of that expense to reside on our balance sheet as inventory. And so they are expensed not for financial stating, statement purposes, but for our internal decision making. They are treated or seen as an expense in the period in which they're incurred. And so you can see that this looks very similar to what we did in the last chapter with contribution margin, but we've added one additional step. So we've now divided our variable costs into the product costs, direct materials, direct labor, variable overhead, to find a manufacturing margin. So we've added that extra step. Then we subtract our variable period expenses, selling general and administrative, to get the contribution margin. That is exactly what we did in chapter 20. Then we look at our fixed manufacturing, those are the product costs, and selling and administrative, those are the fixed period expenses to find our operating income. So you may want to make a note of the, the format here. Sales minus variable cost of goods sold gives us our manufacturing margin. Okay, so that is a new equation for us. And then we subtract the variable period expenses to get our full contribution margin. Okay, the, the same, that is the same contribution margin that we used in chapter 20. The only difference, the only change here is we have split the variable costs into cost of goods sold or product costs and the period costs with this intermediate extra step called manufacturing margin. Any questions about that so far? Okay, looks very similar to what we did in the last chapter. Uh, let's go to our, our first exercise then. So we don't normally go through the examples Excuse me, we don't normally go through examples that are in the PowerPoint because we have our own examples to do. And I assume, make that a little bigger, I assume that at this point people have your chapter 21 exercises open, so we'll get started. Inventory valuation under absorption costing and variable costing. At the end of the first year of operations, so they've simplified this for us. We didn't have any beginning inventory. Everything that's on our balance sheet is from this year. At the end of the first year of operations, 21,500 units remain in the finished goods inventory. The unit manufacturing costs during the period were as follows. And we know those three product costs, direct materials, direct labor, and then the fixed and variable overhead. Under Absorption costing, 
which is required for GAAP, required for our financial accounting. We are going to include all of the costs. If they're product costs, they are included in absorption costing. So 30 plus 18 plus 22 plus 14. for a cost of $84 per unit. That is exactly what we have been doing since day one. What is new in this chapter is the concept of variable costing, where we're including only the variable costs. And so the $22 in fixed factory overhead per unit rather than being on our balance sheet as inventory for internal decision-making purposes, it's on the income statement as a fixed product cost. So we're gonna remove that $22 in fixed factory overhead and include on our balance sheet only $62 per unit. So 21,500 units at $84, is 1,806,000. So same 21,500 units at $62 under variable costing $1,333,000. So the difference is about $470,000. And the change means that rather than putting it on the balance sheet, we put it on the income statement. So in a month that we produce for inventory, meaning our inventory goes up, our sales might be lower than what we produced. We are going to have a hit to the income statement. We're going to still be showing those expenses for the fixed factory overhead, even though we haven't sold those units yet, even though we haven't sold some of those units. And so it can lead, as we'll see as we go through this chapter today and then on Thursday, it can lead us to very different decisions about the most efficient way, the most cost-effective way to run our company. Green check marks in there. So for the fixed factory overhead, um, for the variable costing, we wouldn't have a unit manufacturing cost. We would just have total cost of the factory overhead. We, so I can explain myself well enough. Maybe not because I'm. I mean, we can still cut. We can still calculate the cost of the product. Yeah. So because. So, because the difference here is we have the unit factory or fixed factory overhead of $22 per unit mm -hmm. that we're factoring into the variable okay. based think, on the units. I think I see what you're asking. So instead of having that 22 per unit, it would just be an X amount that we're putting on, on the income statement. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, I would agree with that. So um, what's being said in the classroom is that rather than looking at this fixed factory overhead as a per unit cost, on our balance sheet, it would all show up on the income statement as a lump sum fixed factory overhead. Yeah. And, and so if we were looking at the unit cost of the units we sold that month, again, for internal decision-making purposes, all of that fixed factory overhead would become part of the cost of the products we sold this month. Not the products that we produced this month, but the products we sold this month. Does that make sense? I think so, yeah. So in other words, let me try to say this one, one other way. In other words, that fixed factory overhead becomes a period expense and it, is, it affects the profitability of the units we sell this month, not the units we make this month. As we work through the rest of this chapter, I think it will become more clear why this 
looking at it through this lens could change our decision making and why that might make more sense for our company. Would a company that follows GAAP? So every publicly traded company has to follow GAAP. So um, just throw that, throwing that out there. Trying to think of it's not really a choice for a publicly traded company. Yeah. Um, would they essentially want to do both? I understand they, that. Yeah. Okay. So for internal decision making, they would look at it at under variable, variable costing. Okay. And for, for their reports. external reports, their financial statements, they are required to use the same okay. format that we've been using since day one. All right. Yeah. So that's only for companies that are required to use that? Uh, potentially. I mean, yeah. I, I can't really answer the question of companies who are not required to use GAP, do they use it anyway? Can't really answer that because if they're not publicly traded, they're not required to share their financial statements. And so there, there's a bit more of a um, confidential nature. You know, They don't have to prepare that same annual report with all of the notes of here's how we're doing things. So whether they would for internal purposes just use variable costing, I don't really know. And I wouldn't have access to that to know whether they do or would the accounting, accountant be able to kind of pick and choose whatever principles are kind of easiest for the accounting they're doing? I'd like to think we don't ever choose something just because it's easier if there's a better way of doing it. And I also think it's probably not, when you say the accountant, that it's not the, it's not the people who are actually sitting in the cubicles doing the accounting it's at a much higher level than that, that the decision would be made about how best to, um, to really the question is, how do we best manage our company? And so I guess that would be the question more so, would it be, would the decision for what GAT principles to use be based on whatever's more fitting? I would say. Okay, so if it's more fitting, you just use the variable, they wouldn't even bother with you. Absorption. That could be. So the other thing to keep in mind is if you're thinking, well, why would they keep two sets of books? In reality, they're with variable costing, they're doing that not in their accounting records per se. I mean, it's not going in their general ledger that way because that can't be what shows up on their financials, but they're doing, um, this is how I would picture it. They export the information from their regular gap following accounting, and then they manipulate it to see, to do those internal reports that are going to help people make decisions. The other point is most companies, every publicly traded company really already does have more than one set of books, if you wanna think of it that way, because tax accounting has some different rules than financial accounting. And so they already have, here's what we report on our taxes, but here's what we report on our income statement. And those can be very different depending on, on how the rules are different. So adding one more way of looking at things is not totally out of bounds because they're already thinking about things through different lenses. And again, it's not something unethical. I don't want people to think that I'm suggesting they are intentionally misleading or providing faulty information. That's not what's happening. They're just providing a different lens of looking at the information for tax purposes, for financial reporting purposes, and for internal decision-making. And that's perfectly fine. I was almost wondering if they went through it kind of backwards to what you were saying, and doing like a rough draft with the variable and then doing like the final copy when they have to export the mm -hmm. external things. Maybe. Okay. I guess they could. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to say they do, mm -hmm. but I would agree that they could do it that way. But I mean, instead of thinking of it as like multiple books, it kind of, as long as it works, it helps me think of that that way of. We aren't trying to keep separate accounts, but we have a rough draft and then we have a final draft. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, 
I think that would be okay. So any other questions about this? So you can see immediately the impact of um, what appears on their balance sheet for financial reporting purposes. Absorption costing, the gap required way, makes the company look more successful when they're producing for inventory. So what happened to this company? In the first year, they produced 21,500 more units than they sold. Because at the beginning of the year, they had zero. And at the end of the year, they had 21,500. And so by using absorption costing required under GAAP, the, the balance sheet shows almost $500,000 more worth of inventory under absorption costing than it would under variable costing. Well, if it's on the balance sheet, that means it's not on the income statement. And so at the same time that their assets are higher on their balance sheet, their income is higher on the income statement because they fail to include that fixed um, factory overhead on their income statement in the period in which it was incurred. Again, I'm not saying they did it wrong. I'm just pointing out to you the impact of that when you're producing for inventory, you are shuffling those fixed costs, which you know you would have, that's what fixed means, those costs are going to happen whether you're producing or not producing. And so the, the assumption under variable costing is, yeah, but if you're going to have those costs anyway, they should just go on your income statement. You shouldn't be able to shuffle them to the balance sheet and claim them as an asset inventory when you really didn't um, increase the value of the company by that, by that amount. So let's move on to our next exercise, which is um, income statements under absorption costing and variable costing. So we are given a set of data here about Gallatin County Motors. They, they assemble and sell snowmobile engines. And they just started operations this year which again helps us because they are not, um, not dealing with beginning inventory. So anything that they produced but did not sell would, uh, would be added to their inventory. It tells us that they were producing at 100% of capacity and they produced 4,350 units during their first month, but they only sold 4,000. So at the end of their first month, the end of July, how many motors or engines, sorry, how many engines do they have in ending inventory? 350. They produced 4,350, they only sold 4,000. If they produced and sold exactly the same amount, there would be no difference between absorption costing and variable costing. So as we are, it will, we'll get to the income statements in just a second. As we are looking at the income statements, you will see, based on what we just discussed, you will see that because they produced for inventory, their income under absorption costing is higher than it will be under variable costing where we have to expense the whole fixed manufacturing or fixed factory overhead. So they incurred $130,500 worth of fixed factory overhead in July. Under absorption costing, part of that goes on the income statement for the 4,000 engines we sold, and part of it goes on the balance sheet as inventory for the 350 engines we did not sell. Did I just see absorption again? I need to put a cue card in front of my face. If I just said absorption, you know that feeling like, wait a minute, what did I, did I, that did something niggling in my brain, like that didn't come out right. Variable costing, um, un under absorption costing, part of the fixed factory overhead is on the balance sheet and part is on the income statement. Under variable costing, all of it goes on the income statement. So our income will be lower under variable costing. 
the incentive then becomes, if we're going to be evaluated or judged on our performance based on the variable costing income statement, it moves the incentive from producing for inventory so that we get to hide those fixed costs on the balance sheet, it moves the incentive over to produce what we sell, produce because we can sell it. This concept, I'm gonna put these terms on the screen, is pull through versus push through production. Pull through versus push through production. Pull through production means it's the sales piece that's driving production. I think it's our very next chapter is on budgeting, right? Yep. So chapter 22 is on budgeting. We will spend um, the beginning part of that chapter talking about why sales should drive what we are doing in our business. Why from a management standpoint, it makes sense to do something because you can sell it, to make something because you can sell it. That's the idea of pull through production. We have an order. We know we can sell the product. We make the product because we can sell it. Push through production is more like this. Well, we have some machines and we aren't using those machines. So let's use those machines to produce. We don't have to worry about whether we're selling it or not. Let's just produce it. Pull through production is a worthwhile goal for any business. You should be producing a product because you can sell it, not because you have a machine that's sitting idle. And so as we move the incentive from just produce as much as you can, because that'll allow us to shift some of those fixed costs onto the balance sheet as inventory compared to produce because you can sell it. If we sell what we produce, all of those fixed costs will belong on the income statement with that product. There's no incentive then to produce for inventory. So let's see what this looks like in our exercise. The first thing we're asked to do is the absorption costing income statement, which is the exact thing that we have been doing since chapter five when we introduced the, the multi-step income statement. So the format sales minus cost of goods sold gives us gross profit or gross margin minus our selling and administrative expenses to get our operating income or loss. I don't know yet which one it is. I'm gonna go with operating income for now. So we'll go ahead and fill in this income statement. We're given our sales for the 4,000 units we sold. Our revenues were 2,600,000. Our cost of goods sold, well, we have to figure out of these product costs right here, Oops. So right here, we have $1,957,500. And that was to produce 4,350 units. I hope I can get my annotate up here again. $1,957,500 for 4,350 units is... So our production cost for the month of July, $450 per engine. Everyone agree with that? Okay. So under absorption costing, the only thing that goes on the income statement is the cost for the 4,000 motors that we sold. 4,000 motors at $450 per unit. our selling and administrative expenses to get our operating income. So 
So what do we have on the balance sheet for our inventory? And I don't, I don't think it's asked in this question. Let me just look. Yeah, so it's not asked in this question, but I'm just gonna put a note here on the screen. So for our inventory under absorption costing, we have $450 a unit times the 350 units that we did not sell. And I'll put another line here and we'll get to this in a moment. So under variable costing, we'll have to figure out what our inventory is. Everyone okay with what we just did for absorption costing? Nothing new there, that's exactly what we've been doing. So what is going to change under variable costing? Let's get our format in here first. This is the format I told you, you might wanna take a note. We always start with sales. We always end in operating income or loss. Again, I don't know which one it's going to be until we get there. This is the new step that we introduced. Subtract our variable cost of goods sold to get our manufacturing margin, and then the variable selling and administrative to get the contribution margin that we learned in chapter 19, excuse me, chapter 20. And then we have our fixed factory overhead and our fixed selling and administrative down here. And so what's going to look different? Our sales are going to be the same. How much we charge our customers has nothing to do with whether we use variable or absorption costing. But what's going to be different? This fixed factory overhead, rather than part of it going to cost of goods sold on the income statement and part of it landing in this inventory under variable costing, all of it is going to go on the income statement. Because we produced for inventory, because our inventory increased during the month, we know that the value of the inventory on our balance sheet is going to be less under variable costing. I don't know how much less yet, but we'll get there. How about our variable cost of goods sold? Well, we need to do another calculation. We saw under absorption costing, the cost was $450 per unit, but I'm going to erase that because that is going to change. For our variable costing, we are only including the variable costs direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead. So I don't have a total for those. I'm gonna to need to total those now. Just adding together the variable cost for that inventory. And I found variable costs of 1 million $827,000. And so the variable cost per unit, if we divide by the total number of units we made, is only $420 per unit. So under absorption costing, we had calculated the total cost of those units as $450 per unit. But we now know that $30 of that cost was for the fixed cost that we are moving directly to the income statement. Everybody okay with calculating that variable cost per unit? Simply took out the fixed cost and then calculated our per unit cost. So our variable cost of goods sold is the $420 times the 4,000 units we sold. 
subtract that to get our operating margin, excuse me, our manufacturing margin. Then we subtract our variable selling and administrative 60,000 to get our contribution margin. Then we subtract our fixed costs. Oops. And as we knew would be the case, as we knew would be the case, the operating income under variable costing is less it is $10,500 less under variable costing than under absorption costing. And we can explain exactly where that came from. The $10,500 difference is the extra $30 per unit times the 350 units that are in ending inventory. that extra $30 per unit for the fixed costs, we shuffled to the balance sheet under variable costing, it's on the income statement. And so the inventory would be, hot, would be lower under variable costing because we said that fixed cost, all of that expense was incurred this month. Oops. So it's, what did I say? $10,500 less. Oops. $30 per unit. That's the fixed cost per unit times the 350 units that are in ending inventory. Those costs appear on the inventory on, under absorption costing and do not appear in the inventory under variable costing. So if we think that producing for inventory is not a good plan, if we think that we should be producing because we can sell it, this concept of pull through production, we're producing it because we have a customer because we believe we can sell it, because sales dictate that's how much we should be producing. Hopefully you can see just from this simple example, how using variable costing for our decision-making helps to promote pull through production. Because if we are rewarding our employees, rewarding our managers for making decisions that help the company Producing for inventory is not one of those decisions. We should produce because we have a sale. Now, I do not mean to suggest that when there are companies that are seasonal, that they should not build inventories in the off season to support sales in season. That's not what I'm saying. So um, locally, um, local manufacturer of Cutco, now they're not publicly traded, and so we don't have access to their financial statements in the same way you would for a publicly traded company, as I already said. But when we think about Cutco, there are two times of year that are their major sales times. Summer, because most of their sales force are college students who are working for Cutco in the summer and at the holidays. It is absolutely true that right now at Cutco, they're producing their products to support their summer sales. And I'm not suggesting that they should not do that. It's also a little bit different because they're not publicly traded. If you are a snow shovel manufacturer, starting to make shovels when it starts snowing is probably not a great idea, right? You're going to be producing for inventory in the slow times so that you can meet demand in the, in the busier times. 
What I am saying though, is in general, putting aside those concerns about seasonal um, fluctuations in, in, sell, in sales, producing for inventory when you don't think you can sell that product is not a good plan. That's the concept of push through production and using, using variable costing helps to avoid that because you're incentivizing selling the product, not producing the product. Let's answer part C. What is the reason for the difference in the amount of operating income reported in A and in B? So under which method is the fixed manufacturing cost included in cost of goods sold matched with the revenues? Under which method is all of the manufacturing, all of the fixed manufacturing cost deducted in the period in which it is incurred? That is our new approach, variable costing. Thus, when inventory increases, which, which income statement will have a higher operating income absorption costing? Because we push those fixed costs onto the income statement rather than expensing them in the period in which they're incurred. Oops. Okay. Any questions? We've now looked at the difference and you can see that in a period in which inventory is increasing, we're rewarding that behavior when we use absorption costing. Again, we are required to use absorption costing for GAAP, but we are not required to use it for internal decision-making purposes. And so looking at variable costing helps us to recognize when that is happening and not to reward that behavior. Any questions? Questions, anybody? Please just see the sun's coming out outside. Okay, moving on to our next exercise. Cost of goods manufactured using variable and absorption costing. On March 31st, the end of the first month of operations, again, they're just helping us out by not having us deal with beginning inventory. These concepts certainly apply for companies that have been around for more than one month but it just makes our, our computations easier. During that first month, Barnard Incorporated manufactured 15,000 units and sold 12,000 units. So we already know when we look at absorption costing that the income is going to be higher because we produced for inventory. What we have here is actually kind of the reverse of what we just did. We are given the variable costing income statement and we are asked to find um, what would it look like under absorption costing. So what would be different? When we produce for inventory under variable costing, doesn't matter what happened to our inventory, all of the fixed manufacturing costs go on the income statement. For, very, um, for absorption costing, we're going to take this 210,000 in fixed manufacturing costs and split it between the units that were sold and the units that went to inventory. We're going to shift part of these fixed manufacturing costs onto the balance sheet as inventory. So they've manufactured 15 and, and sold 12. If we were dividing those fixed manufacturing costs across all of the units that were produced, oops, that is. Yes, it took me that long to be able to use my calculator correctly. That is $14 per unit. 
in fixed manufacturing costs. Everyone okay with that? Okay. So under variable costing, all of that went on the income statement. Under absorption costing, the $14 per unit for the 3,000 units in ending inventory, that $14 per unit would be on the balance sheet as part of the inventory. So under variable costing, we're asked to we're asked to find the unit cost of goods manufactured. So that would include the Oh, goods manufactured, sorry, let me. So there's our variable cost of goods manufactured. And here's our fixed manufacturing costs. And for So under absorption, whoops, carried away. Under absorption costing, we're going to include all of those costs. Oops, one million six hundred twenty thousand in variable costs, plus the two hundred ten thousand in fixed costs. Total of this on the screen. So there's our total manufacturing costs, including fixed and variable. And under absorption costing, we would be spreading those total fixed costs over all 15,000 units. Oops. So under absorption costing, we include only, excuse me, we include all of the product costs that we have been discussing since chapter 15. The variable cost of goods manufactured includes direct materials, direct labor, variable overhead, and then we have our fixed overhead here. For variable costing though, we're going to include only the variable costs. And that was for 15,000 units. So we include only the variable cost. Because okay. again, we treat those fixed manufacturing costs as if they were a period cost. Could have just taken the variable costing per unit and then added the extra 14 per unit for the fix. We could have, yes, yep, yeah. So the 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 point made in the classroom because I had already calculated the the 14 dollars in fixed manufacturing cost per unit. We could have calculated the variable and then added the 14 to get to the absorption costing per unit price. Absolutely. Yes, that is the difference. And so under variable costing, we've included all of those 210,000 here on the income statement. Under absorption costing, that $14 per unit times the 3,000 units we did not sell, $42,000 of that fixed manufacturing cost would be on the balance sheet as inventory. Under variable costing, it's all here on the income statement. Okay. 
get any idea? Moving on then. Oops, trace my pictures. So we now have an absorption costing income statement. And this looks exactly like what we have been doing um, since chapter five with the multi-step income statement. But we are asked to, to convert this information into a variable costing income statement. So I think I'd like to ask you to try this one on your own. I'm going to pause the recording and you'll notice in this example, we have the same situation. First month of operations, they produced more units than what they sold. And so they ended up with 25,000 units in ending inventory. We are given the fixed manufacturing costs. So of these total manufacturing costs here, we're told that 450,000 of that is fixed. Of the total selling and administrative expenses, 165,000 were fixed. Now in both cases, those uh, selling and administrative expenses belong fully on the income statement. But in order to use the variable costing format, we need to be able to separate the variable from the fixed um, period expenses. So I'm gonna pause the recording and ask you to work on this variable costing income statement on your own. When you are done, go ahead and restart the recording. So here is what I came up with. So the sales, of course, would be the same regardless of whether we're using absorption or variable costing. The variable cost of goods manufactured is the total that was given up above minus the part we're told is fixed. And so this fixed part is coming down here for the fixed manufacturing. We then need to subtract the inventory, <coughs> excuse me, because this is the total um, variable cost of goods manufacturing incurred during the month. So I took that total divided by the number of units to find the variable cost per unit and then I multiplied by the 25,000 units that were in ending inventory. I've used a negative here just to remind us to subtract. Uh, what, what I have seen with this software is unless it tells you to use a negative, it will mark it correct whether you use a negative or not, unless it specifically says to use a negative. So $300,000 worth of those variable costs would be shifted to the balance sheet as inventory and so the variable cost of what we sold, 3,300,000. Was there a cost of goods sold? Yeah, picked the wrong label there. Um, so that's a total variable cost of goods sold. If we subtract that, and we could put a negative there, again, if it helps you to remember to subtract, we, could, we subtract that from our sales to get the manufacturing margin. Then we subtract our variable selling expense. Well, we had the total given as 275 and we're, we're told that 165 of that is fixed. So the rest of it, 110,000 must be variable. Subtract that to get our contribution margin. Then we have our fixed manufacturing from here, given here. Our fixed selling expenses given here. Total fixed cost 615. I used a negative to remind us to subtract and then subtracted that from the contribution margin to get the operating income. Okay. Any questions on that? So as we are coming up in our last minute of class here, what I would like to ask you to do for next class, before our next class, is try exercise five on your own. So exercise five is really the reverse of exercise four. We're given the variable costing income statement. We're asked to change it back into a absorption costing income statement. So please try that on your own.
when we come into class on Thursday, if there are any questions on that, we can go over those and then we will keep moving ahead in the chapter. If you want to attend the review session Friday morning, please sign up in Starfish. And if there's anything specific you want to go over in that session, please send me an email to let me know in advance. Any questions? All right, see you Thursday.